Uh, good morning, everyone. I believe it's still morning. And thank you for uh, still joining us today after all the technical issues we had. We are also delighted to have with us today our Financial Times team. And I know many of you mentioned uh, this talk before and said that they would love to join. So very welcome, all our participants. Uh, so Federica is a statistical journalist and she's also fact checker for the full facts. And I'm sure we all... Oh, that was my old job. Okay, well, she was, but then uh, I I'm sure, you know, you still have the same skills and we all need to be the fact checks during COVID pandemic and uh, during, you know, current station. Um, and also, uh, I'm welcome John as well. Uh, so John Bern Murdock, uh, I'm pretty sure everyone follows him on Twitter and see his fantastic words as well as his fantastic food. Uh, very impressive. Um, so now, uh, as uh, we are in a bit late, uh, I will uh, ask uh, Federica and John to start presentation. So over to you now. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to start by saying I know that you've had a long conference that was full of very intellectual con um, content. Um, mine is very lowbrow. I don't know. Maybe this will be a relief to some. I saw on Twitter that people were saying that their brains were fried because it was just so interesting. Mine is just going to be very, very fluffy. I don't know if that's a relief to you, but there you go. So the theme of my presentation is um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can all see it. Oh dear God. Yeah, this is the wrong share button. I apologize. I didn't do this before. Um, present. There you go. Yes, so the theme of the presentation, this is something that the RSS commissioned us to do two months ago. This is the Royal Statistics Society, I'm sure you all know. Uh, and it was um, about communicating statistics in the age of short attention spans. And so I decided to do my own guide about how um, how to communicate statistics and what I have learned in my career. And so prepare yourself for the first lowbrow slide. So this is me when I worked as a fact checker for Full Fact, which is a fact checking organization here in the UK, an independent fact checking organization. So they really stress that they're nonpartisan. And what my job used to be was uh, to sort of listen to what politicians were saying. And then, as I said, you know, fact check them um, against statistics and then write a nice little tidy report that summarized what um, you know the sort of our assessment of it and that never used you know the strong words like lie or wrong or right it was always about highlighting nuance and so most of the time i'll explain this emoji i really did feel like this like i was listening to these politicians and sort of rubbing my chin and saying oh, that's not that's not quite right is it and then writing my my report and then i realized after a while that the people who read it were probably the people who sort of had an interest in it and um maybe were people in power who were um making these claims or they were in opposition and they had an interest in fact checking these claims but in 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 the sense that this was a public service the people that i needed to speak to uh the public um i wasn't really writing for them i realized it wasn't really to pay to, for them to pay attention and that wasn't the way that i was writing for it and so i needed to be effectively less nerdy i realized and I had to change who I was and how I thought of myself. And apologies if, if this is going to sound like a therapy session. But then I'm going to move on to my next uh, job. My next job was at the Daily Mirror. And it was actually not that different. I was a data reporter. I focused on politics. So a lot of it was fact checking. And of course, as you know, the Daily Mirror is a partisan paper. So this meant that actually the job was very different. I remember, though, um, something that my boss used to say um, at Full Fact, which is that he felt like the work that we did when we did media appearances was a, had a, a lot more of an impact if we were taking part in a Radio 5 uh, debate, for example, or in the Radio 5 news, rather than Radio 4. So as I said, it was about changing register. And writing for the Daily Mirror and being edited by editors at the Daily Mirror uh, taught me about how to do that, how to change the register. And these are the three lessons that I learned over the couple of years that I spent at the Daily Mirror. And these are you know, very simple rules. The first one is to be simple and brief. Um, as you can see, and to, to give the most essential information in the simplest way possible. 
I really like the third rule, which is to not tell people what to think. Um, and that was that's fundamental as a data reporter, and I'm sure you guys do the same in your work. But as a journalist as well, I wanted to gain their trust and show them both sides of the argument because I didn't want them to think that just because I was writing for the Daily Mirror meant that I was trying to sort of brainwash them. And the second rule is tied to this. Uh, so empowering people to find out more. You will see in the next few slides uh, how we did this. It wasn't just about the story. Um, it wasn't just about the fact check. It was uh, about telling them about the method and how we found these things out and how they could do it themselves effectively. Uh, so this is one of the first things that we did. We fact checked this uh, chart. This is from eons ago, 2013, um, which was uh, tweeted by the Conservatives showing that employment had grown and the deficit is down. Now, if you're familiar with economic statistics, there are loads of problems with these with these um, numbers here. One is that employment, you normally would show the rate anyways. But the main thing is how they presented this chart. And you will know this, it's very misleading. You don't, they don't have a zero baseline, which you would when you are showing volume, which they are trying to do with employment. And so this was our first job, which was to show them actually how it looked. And so it wasn't really about them lying, you know, uh, it was just about letting people know when they were being misled. And then this is sort of some other work that we did, um, which was highlighting how few MPs there were at the time, uh, female MPs, sorry, there were at the time in, in Parliament. And again, done through very simple statistics, a very striking fact. And I don't know if you know this, but one of the number one rules in journalism is that the, the intro or the news story has to be something that you would tell your mates at the pub. And this is a very like simple fact that you would be able to share with your mates at the pub and you would be informing and it's data. You know, people sort of shy away, especially in journalism, uh, from thinking that numbers are important or that they have to be uh, they have their numeracy levels have to be high or their readers have to understand numbers but actually I, I believe that it's very simple and we shouldn't be condescending to audiences they will understand um, what you are talking about as long as you make them interested and that brings me to my golden rules and this is at the point where I sort of questioned the statement about people having short attention spans. I think it, it is a sort of a fashionable thing to say. Um, and, uh, you know, that the internet and smartphones have robbed us of our attention spans. However, I have been rethinking this over the last couple of years. Um, and especially something that changed my mind is, and this will probably be relevant to uh, those who work for the NHS. I have seen people who've been affected by uh, you know, illnesses mainly, learn every single thing there is about that illness, about um, the uh, trials that are happening, and just learn a PhD level stuff about what they've been affected by. So I think if you make things relevant to, to people, they will uh, they will pay attention to what you're saying. And that is the number one thing, uh, which is we have to adjust our register, make sure that that we bear in mind that what we're doing is public service when we're communicating this stuff, especially for you guys. Um, and we uh, and we communicate them in a way that makes people know that it is relevant to them. So uh, I wrote these Federica's Golden Rules mainly because I just wanted to have some laws named after me. And there are sort of harsh truths, truths. So there are caveats, I'm sure there are many exceptions, but um, as I said, this is lowbrow and I'm going to be blunt. So if someone stopped paying attention to you, it's because you're being unnecessarily boring. And this is relevant a lot to, to journalists, but I think even communicating statistics are essential to people's lives. And if someone doesn't understand what you're saying, it's not because they are dumb. I really believe this. It's because you're not doing a good job at explaining it. Now, I've shown you so far slides that are uh, sort of very simple subjects um, of, of work that I've done. But this is one that is a bit more complex, I think, which was to illustrate. Um, this is back in 2016, uh, the um, the conflict between uh, the, uh, the the government and junior doctors over pay, and so 
this is just an example of what I was saying before about adjusting your register and adjusting who you are and how you think of yourself. We wanted to illustrate the difference between these different um, pay proposals. And I thought uh, of myself as a, um, as a junior doctor going through my rota and selecting uh, you know, the different options. So you'll see that I sort of drew this almost as a, as a, as a diary of my, of my week. And that shows you sort of the, the, the pay that the, the different pay proposals and the range, um, which was the old uh, way of, of, of calculating it. And this is to say that even when a subject is very complex, you can make it relevant to people and uh, sort of, as I said, adjust who you are in order to communicate it and do your public service. Uh, and this is the last slide. This is something that John and I have trialed for the last year, um, actually a bit more than that, two years. However, because of the um, lockdown, we haven't been able to do um, these videos for a while, but they're basically explainer videos where we really throw the kitchen sink at these statistics to, to trial different ways to show them. And so we drew them or we use these number blocks that are um, that uh, Italian uh, children in elementary schools used to learn about about numbers and about geometry. Uh, and we, you know, did various other things in order to grab people's attention and teach them about economic statistics, about inequality uh, and even, you know, scientific statistics as well. And it was just a matter of, you know, testing different things to see what worked and, you know, going through our feedback. So I would just say, don't shy away from from doing this sort of thing. Don't be worried <laughs> about looking dumb. I certainly am not worried about, <laughs> about doing that, as you can tell, um, because that's the important thing is to get the message across. Thank you very much. And I will now stop sharing. And over to John. Excellent. Um, a very entertaining presentation to the extent that I now feel enormous pressure. Um, I'm I'm going to be talking about essentially this in the same vein about really focusing on our goal as communicators here rather than people trying to do fancy visual things. Um, but I I just while Federico was talking there, I used a bit of um, synonyms. I did a quick synonym search for lowbrow. And I'm going to frame, frame my presentation as the same, same in principle, but I'm going to use the synonym for lowbrow of popular. Um, just, you know, it sounds a bit more positive. But uh, yeah, I, I think just the key thing is that the FT, this is something we really, really think about. Um, there's, there's no point in doing the work that we do, spending the, the time that we do, if we're then going to put something out in a pretty inaccessible way or a way that people are going to think of as just being immediately over their head. And that's, I think, especially a concern for us at the FT, because the the opinion, the reputation that I think we have with people who maybe haven't read a lot of our stuff is that we are complex and and we're sort of deliberately highbrow. Um, so, yeah, without any further ado, I will now dip into um, my own slides here. Um, so yeah, the, the focus here really is about how we use data visualization at the FT to get get things across in as as approachable a, a way as possible, and and also to think about how people might react to the information we're presenting to them, and therefore how we can tweak our presentation format in order to make sure people don't react negatively, shall I, shall I say, to what we do. So I'm going to start by taking this back to the fundamentals of. Um, the importance of wording of text in charts and data visualization. So I think anyone who's who's caught the data visualization bug, they start off by getting excited about all the cool things they can do with shape, space, color, and geometry. But the research that's actually been done on how people perceive charts says that the single most important thing in terms of the message someone takes away from your visualization and whether they remember it at all is actually wording. So I'm just gonna show you, um, a quick animation in a second, which is taken from this paper. Um, this was a, a study that a, a bunch of American visualization researchers did. They wanted to see exactly what it was that made graphics memorable. So what they did is they took 100 visualizations. These were maps, charts, um, illustrations, all sorts of things. And they put them in front of 
a group of participants for about 10 seconds each. And what they did was they just used eye tracking software to, to look at where people were actually focusing on a chart when they were shown a graphic and told, see if you can take this in and remember it. And so I'm gonna show you where people looked at these charts and what you'll see is a blue dot that moves around the chart, which is showing where people's eyes were at any given time. So what we see is, this is a, a bar chart, nicely dressed up um, so that each bar looks like a book because the information shown in it is the most read books in the world. And this is gonna play on a loop, so you'll see again in a second. That blue dot goes right up to the title. They look at the title for a couple of seconds, then they come down and read what is being said on the vertical axis, and then they read across the chart itself. So the, the first place their attention goes to really set the scene for what they're gonna take away from this is that title. And this chart that I made is then using data from that study to show that when the researchers then asked people to write paragraph descriptions of all the charts they'd seen, um, they went through them and looked at how many times did people mention things like the title, the labels, the paragraphs, versus the contents of the actual plot itself. And again, they find that when people are asked, do you remember this chart and do you remember what it said? All of their focus was on the text in the chart. So as, as Federico was alluding to that, you know, we can, we can make you know, pretty graphics, but if you really want someone to take away the information from those charts, you've got to put it up front in the wording. So I'm going to talk now about how we use that at the FT, and I'm going to use our coronavirus trajectory charts as the case study. So it was um, early March, um, I think first week of March, basically, that one of my colleagues at the FT, one of our, day, um, one of our reporters uh, called Bethan, she sent me this note just saying, um, do we have any data on day by day rises in cases in Italy and other countries compared to the UK? She was finding it hard to get this data through official sources. And this was at a time when Italy was constantly on the news for, for the pretty grim figures coming out of it at that time. And what everyone wanted to know was where does the UK stand compared to Italy and how long might it be before we're seeing something similar? So I made her a quick rough chart here, um, which was essentially the sort of version 1.0 of, of what became our, our very popular coronavirus trajectory trackers, looking at for each country, its trajectory, its journey in terms of the numbers of cases that were being detected by the number of days since its outbreak really took off. Now, the, the geometry of this chart, what is, what is shown on each axis, um, the, the general layout, the colors, are pretty much what we ended up going with. But I think we can all agree, this is a pretty dull, boring, sterile way of communicating the message. It, it, I, there's, there's not a clear take home message here as this chart sat, sits right now. Of course, when we presented it on the site, we did a lot of different things. So again, here's just the basic geometry, just some numbers, some lines, um, not very much words, just saying that this is a chart showing cumulative number of cases by number of days since 100th case. But then when you add on the text here, it, can, it becomes a story, it becomes an actual piece of communication. First of all, the title, most Western countries are now on the same coronavirus trajectory, Hong Kong and Singapore managed to slow the spread. That immediately told people in early March at a time when you know, we weren't in lockdown yet in the UK, nobody really know, knew what was coming down the tracks. This showed people, and, and again, more importantly, told people that most countries were going to exactly the same place as Italy. And the countries in Asia that had, had sort of beaten back the virus were the exceptions to the rule. Um, but it's the wording that does that. If you go back to the version without the wording, you've really got to come to your own conclusions. And so those, those words are really what made this resonate. And we've also got these annotations here talking about what different countries were doing. Um, that chart obviously evolved over time. You can see it now as it was a couple of weeks further on. Um, again, we've, we've actually changed the title here. We're, we're talking about not only Hong Kong and Singapore slowing the spread, but also adding Korea to that. So we're accepting that this story was moving and we needed to therefore move what we were talking about. You'll see um, the annotations as well, we slightly tweaked. And this is all about making sure that we're telling people a story and giving people a reason to keep coming back to this as time went on. We then changed as it became apparent that a lot of countries weren't actually uh, capturing enough data in their case counts. So this chart, um, sorry, this, this next chart here is now actually showing deaths rather than cases. So again, we kept a sort of a very flexible mindset on this and didn't just produce one chart and then sort of leave it out there, but we kept revisiting this and thinking about how can we pre present people with the most important information uh, that they need at any given time. So as I say, this one's now deaths rather than cases. 
We've also got these little stars on the chart representing when countries lock down. And again, you'll see we changed the title to keep that up to date. This, the title is now talking about how Italy and Spain's debt tolls were plateauing, but in the UK and US, uh, numbers continue to rise. So that real focus on the messaging of this chart, of course, the actual geometry, the choice of what to put on each, each axis matters, but really hammering home um, the point that the chart is trying to make in that title. Another, another thing we, we obviously do is we respond to user feedback, even if we may ourselves actually disagree with that feedback. Um, data visualization and communication in general is, is probably one of the domains where the phrase, the customer is always right, really, really does apply. If we're putting out a chart, even though we can sort of justify all the decisions we've made in that chart, but people are misinterpreting that, then that's kind of on us. So here's some of the feedback we were getting in these graphics throughout March and April. Um, and a lot of things here responding to the fact that we were using a logarithmic y-axis on the chart. I'll just flip back to show you that. Um, and this was because when you've got an exponentially growing virus, all the curves on a linear scale would just arc upwards from a gentle slope to a very steep slope. Um, but that we kind of know that all the curves are going to look like that. So by putting this on a log scale, um, we allow a straight line to mean constant growth. So then you can focus on things like you see here with when lines come off that straight trajectory, it's important. It means the growth is slowing. It means they're getting the virus under control. Now, that was my sort of nerdy um, justification for why we did that. But it was clear that it was still causing issues for people. So the, the general gist here was a few people felt that, well, when you put this on a log scale, then the difference as a country moves from zero deaths to 100 deaths is very big. But when it moves from um, 1,000 deaths to 10,000 deaths, that distance is very compressed. And therefore, some people felt that we were sort of downplaying the extent um, and the, the damage that the virus was doing as numbers got higher and higher. A lot of people are essentially feeling that this, this was perhaps politicized and was trying to make the numbers look less bad than they actually were. Um, but we took that on board and we went away and produced this interactive version, which has now been on our site since April, um, which allows people to choose whether they want to show the figures on a linear or a logarithmic scale. It allows them to determine whether they want to use population adjusted or raw numbers and to flip between cases and deaths. So again, even though we had a chart that was it was you know doing very well, it was getting a lot of engagement, we were very happy with it. We didn't just think, well, you know, we this is successful, therefore we are right and the readers are wrong. We actually went away and said, look, we may think that this was the best way to share the information, but plenty of readers disagree, so let's give them the option of choosing both. So I think just being humble about this stuff is really important. Another thing we've done is um, we really think about making visualizations which are sort of the most efficient way possible of conveying some, some information and, and making them using, using shape, space and color to just guide the reader's eye in such a way that even if they've never seen a certain chart type before, the way we use color in these charts will guide them to the most important bits. And one of the ways we do that is we use this graphic format called small multiples, which is where you take a single chart type and you use it multiple times sort of tiled like a, like a patchwork um, for different regions, for example. So probably the most high profile of those we've done is this chart showing excess deaths over, over time. So starting at the start of the year and moving on and looking at how the numbers of people dying from any cause this year has um, compared to the historical averages. So this was how this looked um, a, a few weeks ago. And the point here is that the chart types here, there's, this is not a standard chart type. You know, you've got multiple lines for the historical data, you've got a red line for the new data, and you've got a filled area for the excess deaths. Now, that's not, that doesn't exist as a sort of chart template in any software, and therefore it's not something any reader would be familiar with. However, by using this red shading to show the points of interest, the, the points where countries have had more deaths than usual, what we're doing is we're saying, well, we're not even saying anything, but we're making sure that when someone sees this chart, their eyes immediately drawn to the key points. So anyone who has this put in front of them, they're going to be looking at Peru. Maybe then they'll look at Ecuador, maybe Mexico, maybe the UK. So it's about just using this tiled approach and using those shaded areas to draw attention to the points that stand out. Equally, someone's eye might be drawn to Iceland, where there've been no excess deaths at all. Just using colour to guide people around, even if they've never seen data visualisation at all before. We can also use that to make other points. So you can see, for example, here in the US, we've laid out these tiles according to where states are geographically 
in the US. So straight away, we see the, the very different shape of the outbreak in the Northeast, um, the urban areas where they, they saw these short but very, very acute peaks in mortality during the spring. Whereas you then look at the South and the West, places like Arizona, uh, Texas, Florida, they've seen these longer, more drawn out outbreaks. Although now the, the short, sharp ones, and the longer drawn out ones have similar death tolls. But again, just about using the, that red shading and the shapes to tell the stories and doing this in sort of as, as organic a way as possible. We can also use it to look at things like the fact that the UK saw excess mortality in pretty much every region. Whereas a country like Italy, as bad as this outbreak was, the, the deaths were really um, confined to the north. Um, another, a more recent example of, of that uh, sort of type of visualization we're doing is this one here, charting the number of COVID patients in hospitals um, in different countries around the world, or in, in this case in Europe. And again, we're using the colors here to denote the rate of change in these figures. So that deep, dark uh, sort of burgundy is showing where rates are accelerating day by day. The red is where numbers are still going up, but the rate of the rate of change has slowed. And then the blue is figures coming down. So again, just using colors to draw people's attention to the key points of the chart. So like everyone here would, would look at that Czech Republic spike, for example. But equally, when countries move into the blue, that's a good sign. So using that uh, those sort of semantic associations we have with red and dark red being um, scary, blue being better, just using that to make sure that someone is immediately going to get a sense of what we're talking about. Um, and then finally, an another thing we're doing is trying to actually include caveats to the messages that our charts contain in those charts themselves so that we don't get people reacting negatively to those charts. And what I mean by that is, as I'm sure everyone on this call will be aware, COVID and COVID data have become intensely politicized um, over, the, over the last few months. You know, you've got your, your lockdown skeptics, um, your um, alarmists on the other side. There's, there's a lot of different tribes emerging here and people will, will sometimes react very negatively and simply not trust what you're putting out if they think it's, it's at all biased. So, so what we've done to try and address that is in a chart, for example, about rising death rates, we're making the point that deaths are rising again in the autumn, but at a much slower rate than they were in the spring. If we simply said death rates are rising again, we might have a lot of people who are in the slightly more skeptical camp immediately dismiss that chart out of hand and not trust it at all. And, you know, even though the chart would still be correct, our focus here is on trying to maintain trust and making sure that regardless of what someone's um, own personal views are, opinions are of the data, that they still believe that we're a reliable source. So here's that chart in question. And so instead of just showing the right hand panel here, showing deaths increasing in European countries over time, we're putting that left hand panel showing the same countries and the same time scale in the spring so we can show the two points together that yes death numbers have been increasing over over the last month or two in many european countries and, and of course that is not a good thing but they are increasing at a much slower rate than they were in the spring which does mean that um the the healthcare systems in these countries have a bit more time to respond so people should be concerned but they shouldn't be as as panic stricken as they were perhaps in the spring so that is in a nutshell in a, in a sort of whistle stop tour is how we we really try and think about our core goal of being communicators rather than just being people who make cool um, graphics and data visualizations at the FT. And with that, I will now head back to uh, the panel. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure we will now uh, receive uh, some applauses as well. And Federico, you received your share already. Uh, we do run a bit uh, out of time, but uh, it was to take technical issues. Uh, so just a few questions, which, we, which were the most watched ones. Uh, so first question is, will you be sharing your code to create these charts? And if so, when do you think it will be open? I guess it's a question to John, mostly. Yeah, um, I, I think I shared way back in in march or april just the the r code for producing those charts so more than happy to to do that again obviously the the interactive ones that we made since then are a bit more involved um but i can certainly share the the code for the for the r ones and for various other ones that i showed as well yeah cool uh we also have a remark i can't believe we're at the end of final session uh, well it is almost final session but please stay till closing as well uh, and also another question. Uh, when I mentioned the charts in the uh, Financial Times, I was told that uh, the audience is more educated and dismissed my point about good visualizations. Uh, how would you respond to this view? 
I don't know, for the reason. Oh, sure, the view that our readers are more educated and therefore sort of they can deal uh, with more complex stuff. I, yes, this is how I read the question, but Zoe, feel free to comment uh, while uh, someone is answering questions. You're right. Uh, yes, so how would you uh, respond to you? Um, I'll say a bit and then I'm sure Fed has, Federica has views as well. And um, I think, you know, our, it's true, like our, our audience is, is pretty well educated, but there's still a hell of a lot of people who are quote unquote not maths people or not charts people. And they, you know, they're incredibly smart, but they will, they absolutely don't think that quantitative stuff or data visualization is their thing. And we, you know, we've got one um, pretty sort of notorious news editor who I won't, whose name I won't, who will always, really stress the point that um, our chart should be able to be understood by his mum. Now, aside from the point that I think that's a little bit harsh on his mum, who I'm sure is a very quantitative and numerate woman, um, it's a, it's a, it is at least a useful message for us to be, to be reminded of, that we're not making charts for ourselves. We're not making charts for other data enthusiasts. We're making them for a mass audience, regardless of, of how much education they have. Um, John's charts, uh, well, uh, our uh, coronavirus charts were also the colleagues involved um, went viral on Twitter and were shared very widely on Facebook and other platforms and Instagram and so on so I think they were uh, they became familiar enough for people to of all sorts of education to, to, to be able to educational levels to be able to read them I slightly resist this idea that there are clever people and there are uh, and well educated and uh, and so on. I mean, we have colleagues with uh, master's degree degrees, at least, who will look at a chart and be like, I don't really get it. And I think quite often there are people who are very highly educated who have a tendency to not admit when they don't understand something and vice versa, people who might uh, be able to understand them but will resist it because it's a chart, it's numbers, I, I don't know. So I, I want to resist this. Um, I think actually the beauty of charts is that they are very intuitive and you just need to spend some time with them sometimes. I've, I've worked on very complex visualizations um, and you know sometimes you just have to say, sit down, grab a cup of tea. It's not that hard, it really isn't. Yes, uh, I can see people agree with the, uh, this uh, answers as well. And yes, it was the right question, which is very uh, good as well. Uh, so, and then I think we have possibly one or two more questions. So uh, now more an ethics question from Colin. How did you balance bias when reporting, uh, for example, the Miro or any newspaper? S sorry, say that again. How did I? Balance the bias. Uh, when you I mean, sometimes it was just impossible. Uh, it, you you had to be obviously biased. So I'm, I'm going to be blunt about that. Um, I remember that one time we did a sort of fact check of the election campaign in 2015. And we um, we fact checked Labour politicians as well, because, you know, that, that was sort of my uh, mission statement, uh, fact check everyone. Um, and one uh, Labour campaigner, you know, blocked us and, and called my editor, said he felt betrayed and so on. It was very emotional. Um, sometimes the important thing isn't the, the, the story, as I, as I said before. It's about telling people this is what you need to watch out for. This is where you can get the statistics. The sources are here. This is what people do with charts. And then it's about empowering them and, sa and then saying, you've got the tools now, make up your own mind. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes absolutely. we were pro labor even, even, I mean, because that was the, that was what, you know, the publishers told us to do, sorry. <laughs> No, it's really, 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 yeah. uh, it's really, really good question, uh, and it's a really good answer as well. And uh, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, uh, biases everywhere, including the uh, public sector as well. Uh, okay, I think we have to like have really last question. Um, how do you think we can use interactivity to help audience to understand data and data visualization better? This is a question from Chris. Um, I mean, so interactivity is obviously a hugely useful for this kind of thing, because what you can do is you, you can give people that feeling that they are discovering something for themselves. Um, there's, there's been some amazing work done by people over the years. There's, there's someone I'd recommend people um, check out called Nikki Case. Um, and they do 
these incredible, what they call explorable explanations, where you allow someone to sort of tinker with the parameters to, to get a sense of how a system works. And I think that particular technique is especially, is especially useful. But yeah, just a general idea that when you're allowing someone to make the choices of what they're displaying, I think you make it much less likely that they're going to react negatively to what they see because they feel that they're actually the ones uncovering this stuff. So I think it's it's hugely useful. Um, obviously, it, you know, it, it does come with a, a, a much a much bigger uh, re resource requirement because you know it's not just about making something interactive. It's about making sure it's then going to work on everything from a tiny five-year-old mobile phone to a massive desktop computer and, and you know our interactive covid charts for example took a took several people working for over a month um and and that's because again we as the ft we have to make this stuff work on all devices and a lot of focus on how we use colors for people with different color vision for example so so it's difficult but um but yeah i absolutely think it's a brilliant way of, of getting people to understand complex issues and getting people maybe more comfortable with data full stop. Brilliant, thank you. I don't want to delay you, but since it's our conference, you have one technical question. It's going to be our last question, definitely. Uh, sorry about the delays. Uh, so how did you get this shapes, uh, for example, shading in the subtitle of the small multiple plots? Um, yeah, so that's the, the annoying answer for, for the R users of the call is that that was done in D3, uh, okay. the JavaScript language. So, um, I mean, for, for our users, I'd say the probably the best way to do that is if you use one of the sort of free um, vector editing programs like Inkscape or something, if you export your chart as a PDF, you can obviously add in little shapes like that. Um, but for anyone who doesn't know D3, that's a JavaScript library which just allows you sort of complete control of every pixel on the screen so you can say like all right i want my text subtitle here but then i want to draw a little a little line there as well so so i'd say for anyone who wants to really get into that fine-grained control over graphics um stepping from d3 to r is a good shout but we certainly use r every day at the ft as well still well that's excellent you to know that financial times use and so should everyone else and then the chess uh thank you again a lot i can see you're on the floor so we are doing the uh, there was loads of um, as well good messages and thank you for your time and uh, for all our participants we will see you in the next session bye john and bye Fidika. thank you, you. bye